Hello everybody, my name is Alex Fuchs. I'm a food and beverage photographer from Berlin in Germany and you're watching Easy Food Photography. That's a place where I share all my knowledge and all my little tips and tricks around food photography exclusively with you. So today I'm showing you how to execute this kind of photo. I will guide you through my whole process. This means I will talk about my technical workflow as well as where I got the inspiration for that uh, kind of photo from. Um, and we will talk about storytelling, how to tell a story when it comes to food photography. So when you are into that, lean back and enjoy. Before I talk about inspiration and storytelling, let's have a look at my process and talk a bit about my technical workflow. I'm a Canon shooter from the very beginning and the good thing about that is that Canon shipped two free programs with every new cam. One is called EOS Utility. I'm using version 3 here. It's a remote control software which allows me to shoot easily tethered. I just have to connect the cam which uh, was in this case a 5D Mark III with my computer which uh, was um, or which is a MacBook Pro and that's it. The whole setting needs just seconds to be set up and then you're good to go. And that's really handy when you are on a location client shoot. So the big advantage of that EOS utility software is that uh, it allows me to have a real fast live view mode. So everything in my actual composition can be adjusted live right on the spot and I can even pop the pictures as well with it. Which is great and really handy too. The second software is called Canon Digital Photo Professional. I'm using the latest version, so it's version 4. That software is more or less a raw converter tool like the one which comes with Photoshop. With a lot of different options, you can color correct the pictures or crop it or whatever. You name it, it has it. And you can check very fast and easy the focus of your shot. So what you see right now is that software and you will see in a minute what it's capable of and how I use it usually. I'm pretty sure if you are using another brand like Nikon or Sony or whatever, they might have similar onboard software solutions for you, but um, I have no clue about that. You have to frequent your manual to find out. But for all Canon users, I will link the software um, I use uh, down below. So you may might wonder why I'm not using Capture One, which is more or less the industry standard worldwide, I think. But because I'm shooting Canon my whole career till now, and I'm used to work with that software from the very beginning, and it's for free, I have no reason to change my workflow yet. Never change a running system. To be honest, I will uh, hopefully get a Sony Alpha 7 III soon and then I will change my process and go with Capture One for sure. Because then I can't uh, use the Canon software any longer. But um, yeah, tata for now about that technical workflow stuff. As I said before, I'm shooting always raw because that allows me to have the most out of it in post-production. And I'm sure you're shooting RAW as well. Nowadays nearly every cam can shoot RAW, so just f go for that, please. You have the most options in post-production, so do that. Um, well, let's have a look at the finished composition again and let's talk a bit about my inspiration. When I stroll around in real life or online, I am always trying to get inspired by nearly everything out there. So for example, today I was in a second-hand shop and I found a bunch of really nice old grandma-style cups and saucers. And I'm pretty sure I will use them for some upcoming tutorials. But in that particular case of the teacup, I got inspired by a picture of Andrew Scriwani. Hope I name him right. He's a very famous food photographer from New York and I'm sure a lot of uh, you uh, know him and his work. He did a lecture about basic lightning techniques in food photography at B&H a few years ago and it's available here at YouTube. So he was going through uh, some of his pictures there and then there was a picture where milk is poured in a cup of tea or coffee or whatever. 
Um, I don't want to show that here because of copyright issues, uh, but if you want to have a look, feel free to watch the whole lecture, which is quite worth looking in whole or just click in the link down below. Um, so I saw it on the fly, I want to shoot such a picture for my portfolio because it's an easy and smooth concept. So that was where I got uh, my inspiration from. I just saw an image and I was hooked by it. But when I get inspired, I don't want just to copy the original one to one. More or less, I try uh, to change the setting a bit and let it fit more into my personal style. That's really important. These things need a little bit of transformation, otherwise it's just an impersonal copy. So it was 2 a.m. when I started to set up this shot um, and I found an old gold border tea set from my wife's grandma and a sugar box in the same style. Just to put, put a little bit of, um, I call it patina to the shot and uh, make it more personal. I thought a white background would be fine so that I have a really saturated look and feel. The gold border has a similar tonality as a gray tea and the white matches with the milk as well. So that's the story behind that setup. And now let's hop straight into that and guide you through my process. My first idea was to have a midday look with a lot of shadows etc. So to create that I used a snood on a speed light but I should have known it better. As the very first test shot showed up, the shadows were much too harsh and I knew from that point that I can't get a, a good shot out of that idea. So I changed my light former from a snood to a 40 by 40 centimeter softbox. And as you can suddenly see, that softens the shadows up really good. But for me, that was not soft enough, so I tried to use one more layer of diffusion on that softbox. So I put an ordinary white reflector in front of the softbox and that minimized the shadows to a bearable level. They were nearly gone. And as you can see through these three shots, for me food photography is always a process. I have an initial idea, sometimes really vague like here, sometimes more planned and conceptual. Especially when you do client work, uh, you uh, will be much more better uh, prepared. And then you start somewhere and you have to change and add things in the process. And sometimes you end up exactly as planned and often you end up somewhere else. But that's okay if you are lucky with the end result, so um, then it's completely okay. That's the thing where I like my work. You can't predict creativity. So to come back, why I softened that light is very easy. For me, it felt really sudden that the focus should lay on that beautiful swirl caused by the milk in the tea. So I decided really early to get rid of any distraction for the viewer. So that means that you can't have too much shadows, because every shadow in such a setting is a distraction for the eye. So that's the reason why I decided really early to flatten the light and go for a soft lightning. So let's talk about storytelling. In most cases you're working with macro or even micro sets when you're doing food photography. This means the physical space to integrate storytelling elements are really limited. And to make it more difficult, it's a still picture, it's not a movie. Though the only elements you have to tell the story are by A, creating a mood with your lightning setup, B, any kind of props you could uh, throw into your scene, like knives, bowls, napkins, whatever uh, you want to throw in, and see food styling. And that's it. End of your possibilities. But that should not be the end of your story. It's the story you want to tell through that um, picture. To fully understand that, uh, you should think about that for a minute or two. It took me a very long to understand that by my own. In my opinion, you are getting better and better in your profession when you try to master these three basic things. Lightning, using props for the creation of your world in front of the cam, and food styling. And these three basic things should be in a perfect world, match or interact with each other. And then you are creating a really beautiful picture. 
but that's only how I see it. So maybe you have a different opinion on that. And uh, I would really be interested to hear that. So um, feel free to leave me a comment. So you could probably ask at that point, okay, but uh, what is your picture telling? It's just milk pouring into a cup of tea. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but if you like the picture somehow, it's not because of some milk. That's only the trick to get your attention. I truly believe that if you like the picture, it is because by watching at it, um, it recalls some similar situation where you have seen that before. And you may haven't put so much attention to it before, but now as this particular moment is frozen through my lens, you remember what natural beauty, that primitive act by pouring milk into a tea creates in the tea itself. And that is the story behind that picture. It is working because everybody has an opinion and a feeling about that moment. And that is the reason why I choose a grandma style gold border tea set. Everybody knows such a moment. So it's easy to get you emotionally attached to that picture. It's some basic psychology, you know. So another tool you should use always when you are doing food photography is to attract the viewer, the viewer's emotion. Try to hook people by emotions. Food is a very emotional process. Everybody is doing it several times a day. Everybody has an opinion on food. Everybody has his or her own imagination when it comes to food. We all have um, emotions attached when it comes to food. And we are using some kind of collective memory when it comes to food. We all have very clear expectations when it comes to food. And we all have a really clear uh, imagination how tasty and good food should look like. That's the reason why this fancy Instagram filter has not really worked so well on food. You need the right white balance for food pictures, otherwise it looks wrong and in most cases not really yummy. But back to my setup. Um, so I set up a speed light on a tripod with a softbox and smoothen it with a reflector. Okay, now the picture looks okay for me. Um, it's more or less what I want, but now that the basic light set is built, I want to adjust a few things. First, I want to adjust my composition. I don't like the fork, I don't like the plate at the lower left, and I don't like the creamer because it will be somewhere in the air anyway. And I don't like the focus on one level with the rest of the objects on the table. So what I did was to get tighter with the composition, only have the cup and the saucer at one side and the sugar box and the lid of the, the sugar box at the left side where I used two washers on the lid to get rid of some reflections. That's a really easy way to do it. By the way, the spoons made some nice diagonal lines, so um, I really like that. The next thing is that Nearly everything is on the same field of death and I don't want to have that. I want the focus to sit on the cup only. So the solution for that is more or less a perspective trick. Because it's a top shot, I changed a bit the height of the cup with a wooden trip mat. And because we are in a macro set, this allows me prompt to have nearly anything else slightly defocused. So I decided to lead the viewer's view direct into the cup. Next, the light at the upper top is too bright for my taste, so I um, introduced a black card to darken it a little bit. And uh, because I'm working with speed lights um, without the possibility to have a modeling light, I have to guess where the best place will be. So. Um, I have to, to um, do some shots to find the right spot. So, but that's too much for my taste, so maybe a little bit more to the right. So there we are. Next thing to fix was the light on the bottom of the image. I needed some light for the lower left side where the sugar lid lays. So I introduced a white card to solve this problem. 
And the last thing I fixed was to bring some bouncing light in with a silver card at the lower right side to brighten this side of the cup a little bit. To remember, I did not want to have any shady distraction in the frame, so that was my decision to go for. You want to give yourself the most options in post-production, so for that shot I needed um, three exposures. I needed a clean plate without the creamer, uh, one with the milk pouring in and some where I changed the reflections on the golden border of the saucer um, at the upper left side. So um, this gives me all the options in post-production uh, for wh wherever I want to go with that picture. So I could combine all three shots to one final image. Um, but in this case, uh, I ended up using just uh, the one with the cream and um, I really like that at the end. So um, yeah, that's it. A really easy setup, but um, I think, you know, and the crema to come back to um, the storytelling point, the crema put this little action or freeze this little action in time that uh, pushes the fewer few direct in the cup when you don't um, when you when you look at the, um, a version without the creamer you know it's it's just a boring it's just a boring image so and uh, um, as you see these little things can change everything well that's it for today hope you enjoyed that video feel free to give it a thumbs up or just leave me a comment down below. Um, you can also join my Facebook group or follow my Instagram feed, or you can grab your free copy of my ebook, um, The Food Photographer's Cooking Book at easyfoodphotography.com. Just subscribe to my newsletter and I will send you your free copy. So that's it for today. Live long and prosper. Hope to see you next time. See you.